Today's video is brought to you by my latest book, When Religion Kills, a look at how the so-called faithful in many religions advocate murder in the name of their God. Buy it today. Just click on the link in the text portion of this podcast. Why is it that so many people are so up in arms about repatriating terrorists to Western countries? Is it that much of a priority? Hi, this is Phil Gursky, and you're listening to Quick Hits. I can't tell you how many podcasts, webinars, seminars, call it what you will, that I have received notification for over the past little while about the urgency that Western countries repatriate their citizens who went to join terrorist groups like Islamic State or Al-Shabaab or Hayat al shams or Al-Qaeda or whatever. There seems to be this, this feeling that these poor people are dwelling in refugee camps or in prisons and they're suffering poor conditions and Western nations are failing in their duty towards their citizens by not jumping on planes, boats and trains, planes and automobiles to repatriate these citizens to their own countries for prosecution, de-radicalization, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to sound like a broken record. I know I have talked about this issue quite a bit in the past, but I want to weigh in one more time in the light of a, a couple of things that have happened in the past couple of weeks about this whole issue, whether or not Western nations, A, have an obligation. A, the answer is no. There's no obligation to do anything in this regard. Or B, should make efforts to bring their citizens back from the Middle East, Africa, wherever they went to join terrorist groups to face justice in their home countries. Came across an article in the Balkan Insight, which is a, not surprisingly, a news site devoted to news in the Balkans. And this noted that uh, there are a lot of people left from the Balkans to join ISIS and other groups. And they have, in fact, brought some home. And security officials are really worried. COVID has meant that doing intelligence operations is challenging. Surveillance resources are down. Intelligence resources are down. De-radicalization resources are down. In other words, when you bring someone home who fought for a terrorist group, you have to devote resources against that person. As this article said, they have had a total failure in Kosovo, this is Kosovo specific, to identify those who recruited, facilitated, or those who financed these Kosovars to go to Syria. Only four people have been sentenced so far for recruiting terrorists. I don't know how many have been sentenced for joining the group, but apparently the number is uh, over 200. 200 Kosovars who went to go fight for Islamic State and other groups in Syria. What I've noticed in the debate so far is that the people who are advocating that we repatriate these terrorists, for the most part, not, not exclusively, but for the most, most part, have no background in security intelligence or law enforcement. They're, they're fine people. They've studied the issue. They have very strong opinions. They feel that their arguments hold a lot of water. But frankly, they've never worked on an intelligence investigation, meaning they have no appreciation for what it takes to follow, investigate, arrest, charge, prosecute, and incarcerate someone. They're, they're talking more from a theoretical angle, not from a practical one. As I learned many years ago, doing intelligence or law enforcement investigations with a view to, on the law enforcement side, arresting and laying charges, takes resources that's bigger than a breadbasket. When I used to lecture on radicalization and terrorism years ago, I would often ask my audiences, how many people do you think it takes to follow someone? And invariably, I get the answer, you know, two, four, six, seven people. I said, try between 20 and 40. So that's your surveillance. That is your investigators who recruit and run human sources or agents. Those are the people who have to go through the intercepted uh, telecommunications that are obtained under federal court warrant or other court warrants. In other words, this is not like Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte in a car, which is what Hollywood teaches us about following bad guys. It's much more complicated than that. Bottom line is, is that very few security services have these types of resources. And that's even more complicated given the coronavirus, given COVID-19. So why on earth would any government in the known universe lift a finger right now when it's trying to juggle all kinds of other ur urgent priorities and emergencies to repatriate their citizens who voluntarily went to join a terrorist group? They weren't coerced. They weren't pushed. They weren't blackmailed. They weren't threatened. 
they said, yep, sign me up. I'm going to go join a terrorist group that beheads people, rapes little girls, and throws people off buildings. And we're supposed to repatriate those people? Now, the argument is made that, well, um, we have an obligation because they're our fault. We somehow provided the environment in which they were radicalized, and we should not impose our, our errors on, on other nations, to which I have replied, yeah, you've got a point there. But the fact remains that these people committed crimes in the countries where they're being held. And those countries have a sovereign right to hold those people, to try them, to convict them, to incarcerate them, and, although I don't agree with it, to execute them, to carry out capital punishment if that's the law in the books in those countries. Who are we to tell the Iraqis or the Syrians or the Somalis or the Nigerians or the Pakistanis or the Indonesians or whomever that they have no right to exact punishment from our citizens who committed crimes on their soil? That is arrogance in the extreme. The other thing that people say is that, well, you know, history shows that very few of these so-called foreign fighters, also called foreign terrorist fighters, carry out acts of terrorism on their home soil when they come back. And that is true. The statistics don't lie. And yet we've had cases recently, like the killings in Austria by someone. No, he wasn't a returning foreign fighter. He was somebody who wanted to be an ISIS terrorist. He was picked up by Austrian security. He was incarcerated. He went through a de-radicalization program in which he lied about his commitment to the group, got out and ended up killing a whole bunch of people in downtown, downtown Vienna. And this has been a big brouhaha in Austria. The head of the security service has resigned. Mistakes were made, etc., 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 whatever. But if we can't keep tabs on somebody that we know everything about because he never left the country, how the hell are we going to keep tabs on the rest of the people? As that article in the Balkan Insight said, we don't have the resource to learn everything about these folks who radicalized them, who they were with in Iraq and Syria or Nigeria or Somalia. We won't have the evidence to try these people and gain convictions, meaning they will come back, they will probably be acquitted, if tried at all, and released into society. And yes, somewhere between 1% and 9% will actually do something down the road, so it's a fairly low percentage, but it isn't zero. I'm not even going to go down the de-radicalization road now. That's been largely discredited because of what's happened in many countries. De-radicalization, great idea. I support it in principle. I have no idea how it works and how the hell you measure it. So don't tell me de-radicalization is an optimal strategy for these guys. We simply don't have the wherewithal to do the investigations required to figure out what threat these people pose. And our security intelligence and law enforcement agencies are already going flat out in the midst of a coronavirus to try to do their jobs. I've been in contact with my ex-friends at CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and they're managing, but it's tough. It's tough with social distancing. Yeah, how, how do you do source meets? How do you meet with a human source if you have to maintain social distance? Pretty tough. It's pretty challenging. How do you do surveillance when everyone's you know at home now? Your surveillance car stands like a, th a sore thumb because no one else is on the streets. The bottom line is, no, we have no obligation. And secondly, I am advising strongly against the repatriation of foreign terrorist fighters. They should serve their time, serve their punishment, where their crimes were committed, not brought back here. And I just wish for once that all those people, well-intentioned, otherwise very bright people, would consider the implications, the real life implications, the resource implications, the financial implications of what it means to repatriate foreign terrorist fighters. It's very, very complicated, and I'm getting tired of these simplistic notions of, oh, just bring them home. They're ours. They deserve to be home. No, they don't. They made mistakes. I was taught as a child, you pay for your mistakes. You don't get a freebie. Anyhow, I'm sure there are many people out there who disagree with me. Let me know what you think. You can drop me a line on Gmail, borealisrisk at gmail.com, or on Twitter at borealisaves. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like the content, want to hear more, go to my website, borealisthreatenrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button. Put in your email address. You'll get a free daily digest, all the podcasts, all the blogs, all the media interviews, etc., etc., free of charge, first thing in the morning when you wake up. It'll be your daily dose of terrorism news when you get out of bed. Love to hear from you, what you thought of this podcast and others, maybe ideas for other ones. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe. Mm -hmm.